of the award-winning book, Righteous Republic, The Political Foundations for Modern India, published by the Harvard University Press. Her book won the Crossword Award for Non-Fiction jointly with Ru From the Ruins of Empire by Pankaj Mishra. It has also won the Thomas J. Wilson Memorial Prize from the Harvard University Press and the Tata First Book Award for Non-Fiction. It was also featured on the Books of Year 2012 list on The Guardian and The New Republic. She writes regularly for the Hindu newspaper and scroll.in. She has conceived, commissioned and guest edited several issues of Seminar magazine. She is currently working on a book about Sanskrit in modern times and has a long-term project on the life and the ideas of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. I would now like to invite Dr. Anya Vajpayee to deliver the keynote address. on the concept of India, on the idea of India, on the vision of India, on the imagination of India, on the nation of India, on the history of India, etc. But notion has a rather different connotation, um, you know, a, a different sort of a thani. Um, notion means a mental image. In English, that's what it means. A mental image which does not necessarily have a sound basis in reality. Um, a notion could be highly subjective, it could be speculative, and it could be false. In Hindi, I think there are many close translations. I was not sent this uh, both. I was not sent both. But I looked it up and I found many, many, many words which were given as translations of notion, including mat and rai. Um, but I would have understood it in the first place as something like abhas. And in the worst case, in the most negative sort of sense, as brahm or pranti or galat Um, You know, something which is khayali, which is kalpit. Not kalpanik, but kalpit. Um, so there's a sense of uncertainty, there's a lack of objectivity, and it's not determinate. That's what a notion is. So, a notion is like an illusion, a misconception, or a misapprehension. It's some belief that we hold on to in our mind, which is not well correlated with the facts, and it need not reflect the actual state of the world outside our head. That's how I understand the term notion. So, I asked uh, <laughs> uh, the faculty member who first <coughs> invited me, he was sure that notion was the best word to use in giving the title of a conference did not have a ready reply. So I began to think, is India notional? Is it unreal? Does its, does its conception change from person to person? Can we find any sort of common ground, in fact, between our myriad notions about India? I might have one image of India that makes sense to me. You might have another meaning that you carry around based on your understanding of India. Now, if everybody has their own notion, then how can we be sure that we are even talking about the same thing? As I 
kept on reflecting, it struck me that it is true, actually, that we all have very different notions of what India is. For example, my notion is that as a modern nation state, India came into existence in 1947. Someone else might subscribe to the notion that India has existed as such for centuries and millennia, that it is timeless and eternal. I might have the notion that India is a secular republic based on the Indian constitution. Someone else might have the notion that it is a Hindu Rashtra based on the religion of the majority of Indians. I might have the notion that the northern borders of India are disputed with Pakistan and Kashmir and with China in Ladakh. Someone else might have the notion that India is in fact a Khand Bharat our Sindhu Sindhu Paryanta, stretching from the Indus River to the Indian Ocean. I might have the notion that the meaning of democracy is not simply that every Indian can cast a vote, but that every Indian has fundamental rights, including the right to political representation via a popularly elected government. Someone else might have the notion that democracy means that the will of the electoral majority can ride roughshod over the rights of minorities, and so on. Just giving you examples of notions. Our notions, in other words, are not identical, not similar, and often not even commensurable with one another. We, have, we all have an India that we make up in our head, like the horn of a hair, as they say in Sanskrit. Shasha Shringa, Khargosh Kasim. Perhaps it begins to approach Benedict Anderson's classic definition of a nation, and of any nation that is, as an imagined community, Kalpit, Kalpanik, etc. But imagined actually is not the same as notional. In what is imaginary, there is an element of the ideal. In a notion, on the other hand, we get the connotation of bias. In other words, I still find this term to be quite problematic, and I'm not sure why the organizers of the conference chose it. However, this is the word that we have been given for whatever reason, and I, like all the other speakers, will have to make the best of it. So let me try to do that in my remarks today. Luckily, we also have a subtitle, History, Politics and Literature. So I will use this subtitle to try and present my notion of India in these three distinct but interrelated areas of Indian public life, history, politics, and literature. In each area, now I can't in the time allotted give you my notion and someone else's notion. So others can speak for themselves. Let me use my time to describe to you my notion of India's historical trajectory, political identity, and literary forms. You might agree with me or you might disagree with me. It doesn't matter. Because the one advantage of using the term notion is that we all can and must have different, separate, and diverse notions. The problem is not in professing divergent notions. The problem only arises if any individual or group begins to insist that their notion should prevail over all others. That, I'm afraid, is not a claim that I am willing to accept, and I think neither should you. Don't accept my <coughs> notions if you don't like them. But since you've invited me to be your keynote speaker, you might as well hear me out. So I'm going to proceed like this. I'm going to tell you a story. <clears throat> this story is taken from the Mahabharata, one of our two Sanskrit epics. And it has a wonderful virtue, this story has, has the virtue of combining within it history, politics, and literature. <laughs> history in the sense that it is premised this particular episode in the Mahabharata is premised on the past actions of the Kaurava and the Pandava lineages. Politics, in the sense that everything that happens in the story is a function of war and its aftermath. And literature, because the Mahabharata itself is a work of literature, and I'm also going to quote from other works of literature to explain and elaborate my story. So I noticed uh, that this conference is partially hosted by the Hindi department here in, in ERSD uh, college. So I'm going to allude to some poems uh, by my father, the late Kailash Vajpayee. Uh, he wrote poetry in Hindi and he taught at Delhi University, um, right here actually in the South Campus between 1961 and 2001. 
He died in 2015. So, here's the story. <clears throat> in the 16th book of the Mahabharata, titled Mausala Parva, Musal se Mausala, right? The book of clubs. We find ourselves in the 36th year of Yudhishthira's reign at Indraprastha. The great war long over and an uneasy peace prevailing over the Pandava kingdom. In Dwarka, Krishna's capital on the western seaboard, time is running out. Krishna recalls that the curse of the Kaurava queen mother Gandhari must inevitably fall on his clan, the Vrishnis. Kali Yuga, the last of the four cosmic ages, demonic in its might, awaits its beginning once Krishna passes on. With the inexorable fatality that marks his tenure as the incarnation of Vishnu in human form, <coughs> Krishna sets the ball rolling. This will be the final denouement of the long conflict that has decimated the fraternal Yadava lineages. The supposed triumph of Yudhishthira and his brothers is marred by a permanent sense of exhaustion. They suffer an existential, if not a military, defeat. Through a series of planned accidents and fated coincidences, through pettiness, cowardice, vengefulness, and stupidity, the Vrishnis self-destruct. The sons and kinsmen of Krishna murder one another in an orgy of violence and drunken bloodletting. Krishna, his father Vasudeva, his brother Balaram, and his cousin Uddhava all die. Krishna is in fact felled by a hunter named Jara. Jara actually means old age. He shoots an iron-tipped arrow that pierces the sole of Krishna's foot, the only vulnerable part of his divine body, like Achilles' heel. Arjuna cremates his dearest friend and peerless mentor Krishna, a task that causes him unbearable grief. Now, after Krishna's death, the waters rise up in a huge storm, engulfing the magnificent city of Dwarka and plunging its glittering palaces to the bottom of the sea. Arjuna must escort the women, children, and animals of the Vrishnis. The men have all killed each other. He must escort them to safety. But his capabilities as a valorous warrior are fatally depleted. As the refugees in his care attempt to flee from the massacre and the subsequent deluge, as they flee north to Hastinapura, Arjuna cannot stave off an attack of highway robbers on the way. And this happens in the land of the five rivers. That's the term used in the Mahabharata. So by the time Arjuna returns to Indraprastha, his rescue mission failed almost entirely. Yudhishthira sees the writing on the wall. The war that his side had supposedly uh, won has actually been lost. It is time for the Pandavas to give up their kingdom and depart for their final death march to the high Himalaya. Krishna is gone from the world of men Dwapara Yuga has ended, Kali Yuga begins in right earnest. There's a lovely modern retelling of the Mahabharata which came out in 2015 by Carol Satyamurti. Um, and she says, the past closed up behind them. So in my late father Kailash Vajpayee's Hindi poetry collection, Dubasa Anduba Tara, this was published in 2011, um, we find a series of tableau, dialogues, and meditations. They all unfold underneath the Ashwatha tree in the mysterious Prabhas Kshetra, a luminous stretch of wooded beach between land and sea where the immortal Krishna paradoxically awaits his demise. Bari Gehen Gatha Hai Hatya Ki, the blue skinned one ruminates. The saga of killing is unfathomable. So in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna revealed himself to Arjuna's time, Kala. Here in this poem, he says, <clears throat> about time, he says, Bhavishya ki niyati, okar sam samaik, beet beet jana hai. Bhavishya ki niyati, okar sam samaik, beet beet jana hai. Main bhi ab bita, ki abhi bita, ki beet gaya. This is Krishna speaking. The future must become present and then past. I too am about to pass, but I am passing, and lo, I have passed away. 
A little later, Krishna says to Jara, the hunter, the same hunter, old age, whose name means old age, um, he's already shot Krishna and the arrow has started, has pierced his foot and the poison is entering Krishna's blood. So Jara begs Krishna's forgiveness and, and, and Krishna says to him, he begs, uh, Jara begs forgiveness for mistaking the God's darkly glowing foot for the eye of a deer. And Krishna says to him, Kshama ka koi sampradaya nahi. Forgiveness transcends all sectarian, sectarian differences. Asal mein kshama dhruv tara hai. Truth be told, forgiveness is the pole star, the one fixed point that orients the vast, slow turning of the moral universe. Now this short poem, it's called Krishna Kshamadam, uh, Krishna's act of forgiveness, is strongly reminiscent actually of Portia's speech in Act 4 of Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, um, where we see the lines, the quality of mercy, Kshama, the quality of mercy is not strained, it droppeth as gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. <clears throat> My teacher uh, was a Sanskritist named Sheldon Pollock. He reminded me of this little discussed but nevertheless significant chapter of the great epic, the Smosala Parva, in the aftermath of the 2019 Lok Sabha election in India and the lead up to the American elections in 2020. Um, uh, uh, Paul, Professor Pollock is an American. I reread it not because of any perceived analogies of plot or personality to events and persons in our contemporary moment, but because of the sense of doom, moral collapse and political ruin that colors this blood-soaked book, The Morsel of Parva, and because of its unmistakable messages, that's why I revisited the story, that civil war has no happy endings, that fratricide polarizes and ultimately hollows out a society beyond saving that the sturdiest alliances and mightiest empires collapse before the tsunami of unethical ambition. Whatever the cast of characters, there are no gods and no heroes in the Mahabharata. A naked struggle for hegemony that decimates every delicate <coughs> human construct with brute force. A protracted and apocalyptic battle throws all dharma, all principles and all relationships under the wheel of a heedless, and indeed, in the figure of Dhritarashtra, a blind will to power. Those who somehow remain after the catastrophe, they too will club one another to death. Not only are there no victors, in fact, there are no survivors either in the long run. This here in the Mausala Parva is the timeless folk wisdom of India. This is the conclusion of the master text of Hindu culture. This is what we have always known and recounted. How far a cry from the triumphalist history um, of the Napoleonic Wars and the devious stratagems of Clausewitz that the new Machiavellis bandy about nowadays. The death of Krishna and the mass suicide of the Vishnis end Yudhishthira's half-hearted reign over Hastinapur. The five Pandava brothers and their wife Draupadi set out on their final journey. As they climb ever higher into the cold and barren Himalaya, one by one they die on the way. Only Yudhishthira makes it, together with his dog, to the gates of Swarga, the celestial realm. Indra, the lord of gods, stands there waiting to welcome the weary king, but he insists that he leave behind his canine companion. Yudhishthira refuses. We have come this far together, he says, of the beast waiting patiently by his side in the snow. We go on together, or I will turn back and die here on earth, one with my wretched family and my loyal dog. The god and the man are at an impasse, as the animal between them awaits its fate. But suddenly, the dog disappears to be replaced by dharma, the very principle of righteousness, the law that undergirds the order of things. Dharma, Yudhishthira's progenitor, has given his son a final test, which he passes with a demonstration of that very quality of mercy which Krishna discusses 
with his hapless assassin in my father's boy. The war may be lost, the kingdom forfeited, the band of brothers sundered, the omniscient avatar departed from an irredeemably flawed world. But the dog is saved, and with that, justice is done. There is no further impediment to the entry into heaven. Yudhishthira ascends Indra's chariot and is whisked away into the vanishing heights of a crystal sky. So to summarize my notion of India then, <coughs> India is a place overflowing with stories. Why? Because it is a place overflowing with human experience in all of its variety and splendor. It is a place where for centuries the greatest seekers and thinkers have meditated on the quality of mercy, kshama. I'm also going to now um, share with you a couple of verses from Tulsi Das and then um, a couple of verses from Narsi Mehta, the medieval Gujarati poet, whose uh, work Gandhiji liked and he used to uh, sing as part of his prayer ritual uh, at Sabarmati Ashram. So here is one of my favorite verses from Tulsi Das's Vinay Patrika. Uh, and I'm not, maybe I want, maybe I read the whole thing, depends how we're doing from time. Um, it's, 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 a sh it's a short verse. It says, um, Aiso ko dar janmahi, vinu seva jo dravay din par ram saris ko nahi. Jo gati jog viraj jatan kari nahi pavat muni gyani, so gati det gid shabari sa prabhu na bahut ji jani. Jo sampati das sis aras kari, ravan shiv pahalini, Wo sampada vibhishan kahe ati sa kuch sahit hari dini. I'll just explain it to you. Tulisi das sab bhati sa kar sukh, सब भांति सकल सुख जो चाहे सीमन मेरो तय भजुराम काम सब पूरन करे कृपा निधि दे ओके सो द मेन लाइन व्हिच आई लव एंड फ्रॉम व्हिच अनुराग मिश्रा सिंग्स दिस यू मस्ट हियर इट ऐसो को उदार जग माही बिनु सेवा जो द्रवे दीन पर नाम सरस को नाही दिस मींस दैट कौन ऐसा उदार है इस जग में जैसे नाम है Binu seva jo drave din par, who pours his mercy onto the most wretched, even without their effort, even when they don't do any service to Ram, Ram has so much mercy, so much udarta, so much of this quality of mercy in him, that he showers his grace upon the wretched. Binu seva jo drave din par, Ram saris kaun nahi. This is my notion of Ram, by the way. And then he explains that he was kind to the wretched bird Jatayu uh, who died trying to save Sita from abduction. He was kind to the old woman Shabari uh, who was living the life of an ascetic. Um, uh, and he gave them the Paramagat. Jogati Det Geet Shabari Kamu. He didn't think a lot about it. He didn't think that he was doing them a big favor. He just gave them the Paramagati. Right? And Ravan, in order to gain his Prabhutva, you know, his, his Sampada, his Sampatti, his power, his sovereignty from, from Shiva, he had to sacrifice his ten heads and lay them at Shiva's feet. That same power, that same sovereignty, without thinking for a second, in fact with hesitation, right? Sakuch Sahit, some coach is some coach way, Vahi Sampati, Vahi Sampada, Ram ne Vibhishan ko Devi. Right? This is Udar, an example of this Udarta, right? So then Tulsi Das says, if you want you want so many things. I want so many things. Har bhatsa bhanti sakal sukh jo chahe si man mero to bhaju ram kaam sab pura kare kripa nidhi tero. He is an ocean of kripa. Kripa meaning something like udarta. Right? Of grace. Right? He, 
He is full. He is an ocean of mercy. And whatever it is that you want, however wretched you are, however dean dean you are, you can have it with true devotion to Ram. This is Tulsi Das and Vision. Our country, a microcosm of human history, my notion of India, a repository of all experience, an archive of all knowledge, a catalog of all atrocity, and a beacon of all wisdom. This land that we call by its customary names, India, Bharat, Hindustan, this India, this idea that we call India, this dearly beloved home of ours on whose, on a planet whose very survival, in fact, is today in question. What has India come to? Did we exercise our franchise to lynch the weak, the to murder minorities, to defend the killers of Mahatma Gandhi? Is that what our wanted civilization was all about? And since I speak of Gandhi and since one of the sponsors of this uh, conference is your Gandhi and Baker uh, study circle, I'm going to end with, uh, with, a, with a bhajan which Gandhiji used to sing uh, uh, and have all his followers sing, uh, which all of you know. Um, it's written by Narsi Mehta, a medieval Gujarati poet, um, a bhakti poet. Um, Vaishnav janto teni kahiye je, kir parai jane re. Par dukhe upkar kare toi man abhiman na aane re. Now look, all those ideas are here in it as well. Peer parai jane. Jo dusre ke dukh ko samjhe, vahi asli Vaishnav hai. Par dukhe upkar kare toi. Whoever is kind in the face of another's suffering, without abhiman, man abhiman na aanare, right? Let me remind you of this beloved and beautiful song of a man whose political and spiritual memory is daily being impugned in today's India. Let's pay attention to the central theme of this bhajan, which is empathy, the ability to identify with the suffering of another human being. Consider that person to be pious. Vaishnav janto teni kahi, usko kahi aap, says Narsi Mehta, who can feel another's pain, peed parai jani. If he reaches out to alleviate another's hurt, par dukhe upkar kare, and if he does so without pride, man abhiman na aane re, right? Out of his own compassion, he reaches out when another person is suffering. How terribly the reigning ideology has distorted the essence of Hindu piety and twists what it means to be a true Vaishnav Jan, the equivalent in medieval Gujarat of a devout Hindu. Narsi Mehta wrote and Gandhi advocated sincere fellow feeling, the capacity to suffer for and with someone else without self-congratulation as the quality that makes anyone a real Hindu. A dispensation that normalizes the terrorizing of minorities, the lynching of Dalits and Muslims, and breaking all bonds of human solidarity and mutual respect that have kept us together as a political community, despite all sorts of differences, simply does not use the same idiom as Mahatma Gandhi. Nor is it truly Hindu in any recognizable or traditional sense of the term. My notion of India is at odds with the slow, steady erosion of empathy as a public value, leaving us morally impoverished, lesser human beings, and lesser Indians. Thank you for your time.